Let me read to you a passage from the third chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 13 to 17. It's the Gospel for the Feast of the Triumph of the Cross of Christ, on September the 14th. St. John writes, Jesus said to Nicodemus, No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's from John chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, the Gospel for the Feast of the Triumph of the Cross of Christ on September the the 14th. And what does it suggest to us? Well, it has often been pointed out how important for a true education is the study of history. One wonders, though, how many who read history ever attain something of a philosophy of history. By that I mean an understanding of some of the basic factors that seem to underlie and shape the course of the history of man. Of course there are different philosophies of history. Karl Marx and his chief philosophical source, Hegel, had a philosophy of history. History, they thought, is driven by a struggle between what we might call a position or a thesis and its counterposition, its antithesis, issuing in a settlement or synthesis between the two, out of which there arises a new antithesis. Thus the dynamic of history continues, which is a dynamic of struggle, and it shapes the course of human affairs. Well, Apart from all that that account does not explain, it does not by a long shot even specify the true nature of the struggle. Karl Marx, for instance, thought the struggle was between the class that possessed capital and the class that had only labour. The upshot of the struggle would be a classless society, but no. A philosophy of history must surely begin with what the enlightened conscience of man knows to be the true object of struggle, the great fact of sin. Man must struggle against sin, especially his own sin. The moral imperative of human history is the triumph of what is good and holy. This basic scenario includes what man in his conscience also senses, the fact of an all-holy God who does not condone sin and who calls man to work for the triumph of what is good. That is the meaning of history. But man discovers and easily sees that this is beyond his fallen and wounded powers. As St. Paul writes, all men are under the power of sin will enter then the good news revealed by the all-holy God, the God whom the conscience knows to be the foe of all sin in man and in the world. God has come to man to break the power of sin and to bring about the triumph of holiness in the heart and soul of man. This is what history is all about, and God himself is the chief protagonist in the struggle. The amazing thing about it all was the means whereby God prevailed. Just as the victory was unique, so were the weapons of victory unique. The weapon? The weapon was not apparent success, but apparent defeat. Today we celebrate the triumph of the cross of Christ over sin in the world. Sin has been conquered at its root. And this victory 
must be brought to the heart and soul of each person. But today we think of how it was done. God sent his Son to the world to take away the sin of the world, and he did not do this by the normal human means of triumphing over evil. In normal human affairs the progress of evil is forcibly resisted. The perpetrator is resisted by force, in some sense, and this will always make up part of the answer to sin, of course. But it is not the main answer. It's not the root answer. Christ endured opposition, hostility, rejection, humiliation, and finally a brutal passion and death. The astonishing thing is that he submitted to this as the divinely intended means of victory in the struggle against the sin of the world. It was precisely by means of his rejection and death that he prevailed in the struggle. He triumphed by means of his death on the cross. He prevailed precisely by being defeated by his enemies. And he freely submitted to this defeat because he knew that it was by being rejected, by suffering, and by being put to death in obedience to his Father's will, that he and those who placed their faith in him would enter into glory. The abundant life he had come to give flowed as a direct result of his death on the cross. And we see a token of this in the manifest results of the preaching of the infant church. With Pentecost there was an outpouring of grace leading to very many conversions. And you know, there is a further implication of this. It is that if we follow in his footsteps, if we suffer with him, and if in daily life we die with him by denying ourselves, by denying ourselves, in him our efforts too will prevail. So if a disciple of Christ suffers in the doing of God's will and in bearing witness to Jesus and to his teaching, then even if it seems that he has been a failure in terms of influence over others, his oblivion and seeming defeat will be the seed of a new outpouring of divine life in the world and a new advance against sin. In his life, just as with Christ, the cross will triumph. The humble servant of Christ who suffers in obscurity will shine like the sun, as our Lord says in the Gospel. The lesson of the triumph of the cross is the most important lesson of all if human history is to be understood. Sin was and is overcome by means of the cross of Christ. Let us then resolve to be united to him and united to him in his sufferings. This is the grace to be prayed for and when suffering comes let it be borne in union with the one whose sufferings redeemed the world from sin. Whatever be the suffering, let it be suffering in union with Jesus for the sake of God and his holy will. If this is the suffering that we bear, it will be the source of victory. By means of Christ's cross, man is able to triumph in the true struggle, which is the struggle against sin.